Wonderful. Thank you. So I would like to welcome you all to this session for uh, second year students. It, this webinar is to talk to you about how to develop a research question uh, using secondary data. And it is really my pleasure. Uh, my name is uh, Danielle Ompad, uh, and I am one of the faculty here at the School of Global Public Health and Epidemiology. And it is really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bather. Dr. Bather is a visiting assistant professor of biostatistics and the statistical director for the NYU Center for Anti-Racism, Social Justice, and Public Health here at the School of Global Public Health. He is a statistical epidemiologist whose research centers on novel applications of statistical methods to investigate social, structural, and environmental factors of, um, affecting health outcomes. Uh, he aims to provide empirical evidence that will inform targeted interventions, policy decision-making, and effective prevention strategies. He received his PhD and AM in biostatistics from Harvard, mm -hmm. an MS in applied statistics from NYU, and a BS in statistics from Penn State. So we are really um, pleased to have uh, Dr. Bather speak to all of you about secondary data analysis. Uh, if you have any questions as this is going on, um, you can put them in the chat if needed, or perhaps Dr. Bather might entertain them. But I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bather. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Let me see if I can share my screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, we are. Um, okay. And which screen do you see? I have like two monitors. We see how to develop a research question using secondary data, and it is the slide presentation. All right, great. Thank you. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about how to develop a research question using secondary data. Um, I had the slide in here. I, I wasn't sure if it was going to be in the in the introduction, but as as was mentioned, I got my PhD in biostatistics from Harvard University. I got my what? AM, which is a Master of Arts in biostatistics, also from Harvard. So I got this during my PhD. I didn't. Um, a lot of people tend to ask um, how you get that degree, and some programs have a master's degree program built in with the PhD program. And before that, I got my master's in applied statistics at Steinhardt. Um, and before that, I got my BS in statistics from Pennsylvania State University. So before I get into, into the discussion today, you know, I want to show you a little bit about my, my um, publication. So I have 12 first author publications. I have 11 publications where I'm the lead or collaborative statistician, and then I have um, two other publications where I'm, I'm just a co-author. So I wanted to give you this because, you know, I wanted to show you the credibility and, you know, a lot of things that I will talk about today are to get you to that goal is, you know, ideally to publish your thesis. So some of the screenshots you see here. So in the top left corner, this was actually... Um, a paper I did with Dr. Goodman. Dr. Melody Goodman is one of my mentors. Um, so we do a lot of work in diversity and academic public health. So the first paper talks about um, racial ethnic diversity, not only at the student level, but um, in the faculty and um, faculty of biostat and epi departments. Um, the second paper right below that, that's actually a paper I have with one of my collaborators at the University of Utah. And the first author is a very close collaborator with Dr. Goodman. So you can see how the mentorship network um, allows, allows for you to get other co-authored papers. And then the bottom two papers are the first two papers of my dissertation um, when I was at Harvard. So the first one is in a the first one is what you would call a novel application in a new area. So I use a, I use an approach that was developed in criminology at Carnegie Mellon, which was used to study criminal patterns. But I use this approach to study um, emotional behavioral functioning of children born to women living with HIV. 
And then the second paper is more of a statistical paper that was published in Statistics and Medicine. So it was a simulation study looking at um, the impact of missing data and correlation on an approach called multiple informant models. So here's just like a rough sketch of the process. Um, so first you wanna develop a novel research question and novel is key because that's what journals are looking for. Um, you know, oftentimes when you first think of a question, um, it may be good, but you wanna research, you know, go on Google, go on Google Scholar, PubMed to see if that question hasn't already been answered because if it has been answered, then, um, you're less likely to get it published. So you wanna try to find something that's novel that nobody hasn't done. And this doesn't have to be like a no, Nobel Peace Prize or anything like that. It could be a small tweak or you know, just a small extension to an already existing research question. And so I have an arrow going from that to a comprehensive literature review and then back to the novel research question. So that part is an iterative process. Um, where you're gonna keep searching for something until you find that it hasn't been answered. And so after that, once you find something, um, I call it a concept proposal, but you know your thesis course may call it something different, but that's pretty much what you're gonna be doing in the fall semester is just drafting like the background and rationale of your project. So you're pretty much justifying um, the research question, you want to provide um, a literature review, like what's going on in the literature um, and what don't we know in the literature. Um, when I first started doing research, Dr. Goodman told me, um, you know, being in research is like being a salesperson. So you have to be able to sell, um, sell your research question. Like, why should someone care? Why is it important? Like, why should someone read your paper? And so that's what I think about often. And so after you've drafted that, um, then you wanna perform the statistical analyses that you've planned. Like, you know, you often hear a statistical analysis plan. So like, how do you plan to analyze the data? Um, that could be univariate analysis, bivariate, multivariable, um, and so forth. And then after that, um, there are some other parts within, but you know, you can draft a publishable manuscript depending on how many co-authors you have, you may want to share with them and then, you know, back and forth. And then after that, you can, your advisors may tell you if it's ready, if they think it's ready for to be submitted to a journal. So some ways that I find projects to work on, um, when I first started, you know, I didn't really know what was in the literature, um, but, you know, thankfully I had good mentors, good advisors, and they had projects that, um, I could work on. So that's where um, I started. Um, at the end of this presentation, there'll be some slides talking about lightning talks, which you can attend at the beginning of the semester. And in these lightning talks will be um, faculty from across different schools at NYU who, who will have projects that you can work on for your thesis. So that's one approach to um, finding a research question. And then the second approach is to um, find it on your own by looking at publicly available data sets. And so that's a lot of what I'll talk about today. Um, so here you have about like six publicly available data sets. Um, my next slide has a lot of these and don't worry if you don't catch them right now because these will be shared to you when you take the thesis course. So I'll start with an example. An example is the household pulse survey. This survey is actually one of the options that you can choose from to do your thesis. And so the purpose of this survey was to, is to evaluate the social and economic impacts of the coronavirus pandemic on US households. And it has a lot of measures that include concerns related to inflation, access to infant formula, um, and you know your standard household demographics. Um, it's an online probability-based cross-sectional survey fielded by the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, you may be familiar with the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, if you're not familiar with the pro what a probability-based um, sample is, it's it's that um, it's an approach and survey methodology where like it's impossible to sample everybody in the country. So we have to find a way to sample. Um, 
a smaller portion of the individuals and then assign probability so that they can um so that each individual has a different probability of being selected into the survey. And then it covers the 15 largest metropolitan statistical areas, and they collect data um, two weeks on and off. So it's still going on. Um, you may get a text to participate. Um, I've gotten a text maybe last month to participate, but yeah, it's still going on. Um, and then the households are randomly selected from US Census Bureau's master address file with one individual per household being asked to complete a 20 minute questionnaire. So when you go on the website, you know, I took some screenshots. These are some of the things you'll see. And so when you go on the website of any publicly available data source, you know, there are a couple of things you want to look for. You want to look for um, the data. So in the right corner, you'll see you have us, you can get it in SAS or you can get it in a CSV file where you can open up in Microsoft Excel. Also, what I, um, what I suggest that you look for is a questionnaire or survey. And what you should do is open that survey or questionnaire and just take some time to sit there and just read through it. Like act as if you were taking the survey yourself. And so why you should do that is because there may be a question that, you know, piques your interest. And so you can start there. You can take this question and then develop it into an outcome and then, you know, develop it in, into a research question. And I'll show you that in some later slides. So um, I also use Google Scholar. Google Scholar, um, I use it a lot. So what I, what I did here is that I looked up household post survey. And so I put that in quotation marks to show me all of the all of the articles that have household post survey in their text. And so what this results in is 4,540 results. Um, and what this is good for is that you see how other people have analyzed the data, how they've um, constructed measures, um, and also what has been studied. So, you know, back to my earlier statement about making sure your answer making sure your research question hasn't been answered. This is a good approach to, um, to find, to help you address that. And I, I do want you to keep in mind that although it shows 4,540 studies, that does not mean that all of these studies analyze the household post survey. So it could be that, you know, a paper mentioned um, authors that analyzed the household poll survey did such and such. So that paper didn't really analyze the household poll survey. It just mentions the text because that's what it was told to do, to search for any text that mentions these three words. And I say that because it could be even um, fewer surveys. I mean, fewer manuscripts that use the household poll survey. So, um, why this is important is that there are data sources and when you find a data source like this where there hasn't been much published using that data, you know, this help, you know, there are probably questions in there that will help you get to a novel research question. This is what I mentioned before. So I have some screenshots um, from the questionnaire. And so you'll see two questions. The first question states, in the area where you live and shop, do you think prices in general have changed in the last two months? And so that has four options. And so this, the first option, I think prices have increased. So if you click that option, you will be shown the second question. If you didn't, you won't be shown the second question. And so this is like one of those survey logic type of questions. So the second question asks, how stressful, if at all, has price has the increase in prices in the last two months been for you? So we see like a, a four four item, I mean, a four level measure, very stressful, moderately stressful, a little stressful, not at all stressful. So, you know, as a statistician, you can, this can be your outcome. So you can think of it as an ordinal outcome because there's an order from not at all stressful to very stressful. Um, you could also look in the literature to see how they, how they use this measure. Some may dichotomize it, like make very stressful um, 
one versus the other categories are considered zero. So then you could have a binary, which will, will mean you have like a logistic or a log binomial regression. And so now I'm building on my prior Google Scholar search. So I searched, at first I searched household poll survey, but now I put and in capital letters. So this is telling me I want all the text that has household poll survey and inflation. And so now you see we have 616 um, studies. So it's getting even smaller and smaller, which is better. And, and then when I look at these, I'm getting other phrases that I can take as notes. So inflation, con inflation concerns, inflation stress, inflation hardship. This will uh, be useful to you um, when you do your literature review and you're just looking at wh what the literature is talking about in regards to stress related to inflation. So these are some other phrases that other authors may use. So now let's, let's look at two papers that use the household poll survey and they studied inflation. So if you look at the authors, um, you might notice some similarities. So this, this is very common in research where you may have a research team where one person leads one paper and the other person leads the other paper. And as you can see, the first two authors are, are reversed. So that's probably what the situation was. And so in their method section, I'm showing you the first part of their method section. Um, they're telling you a little bit about the household poll survey. A lot of this information you can get on the household poll survey website. Just paraphrase it and use your own words to describe it. And so let's break down the first study. So they have an ordinal outcome, inflation stress. So this was the question that I told you about um, with the ordinal levels. And so they're looking at predictors of inflation stress. So some of the predictors they chose were gender identity, race, ethnicity, age, marital status, education, and household income. These are um, pretty standard sociodemographic factors that you'll see across many fields. And so what you would use to analyze, um, to analyze this relationship is a um, survey weighted ordinal logistic regression. So it's just an ordinal logistic regression, but you have to incorporate the weights. So the weights are needed because let's say you have a hundred people that took this survey, but we need to add weights so that it can look like the population that we wanna study. So when you incorporate the weights, you will have a larger sample size. You may have um, like in the millions because you know that's how many people are in the United States. So that's what, it, that's what you would do. So if you don't incorporate the weights, the inferences that you're making are just on the people who took the questionnaire. But what you need is the inferences based on the target population. So the authors in this paper, their objective is in this survey study, we consider how inflation stress varies across sociodemographic groups in the American population. So if I were to paraphrase this into a research question, um, what they're interested in is what sociodemographic characteristics are associated with inflation stress among US, US adults. And so when you write your, um, when you're writing the method section of your paper, you kind of have these, these main sections. So the first is the study design and setting. Um, you'll get a lot of this information from other published studies that use a survey. Um, this was kind of like those first two paragraphs I showed you in some previous slides. Um, and then you could just use your own words and paraphrase because it's the same study. Um, it was collected the same way. Um, nothing has changed. So you just have to describe the data source. And next you have your analytic sample. Um, this this was a major thing in randomized control trials where you know you want to visualize how you arrive at the sample um who was in the control group who was in the treated group but these diagrams have become more and more popular in observational studies as well um because you have missing data you have different um criteria to meet um to get into your analytic sample so you need to describe that so the reader um, can pick up your paper and replicate your study. Next, you want to 
describe your dependent variables, um, also call your outcome measures. So provide details on how the outcome was measured. So for example, um, if you're interest, interested in that question I showed you, inflation stress, you can just see how others have described it and how others have measured it. Um, you don't want to just model it some way that it hasn't been modeled in the in the literature. So if you can get like, um, if you can justify your rationale for modeling it a certain way based on um, the literature, that's great. Um, next, your independent variables. So I have two different bullets for this. And so this is what this is why I'm thankful for epidemiology because as a biostatistician, we don't really talk about the different the different ways to set up um, studies. So first, you can have um, like the first study where you're focusing on all of the variables in relation to the outcome. Um, but for the second bullet, you can be interested in one variable, one exposure, condition, treatment in relation to that variable controlling for covariates. So in epidemiology, that's kind of how you want to phrase it. Um, phrase it sometimes is like you're interested in one variable X in relation to Y, and then you have a bunch of co you have your covariates, what we call Z. Um, but in the first bullet, you're looking at all variables in relation to the outcome. So there are different ways to um to like think about your study and what your study goals are. And then the next section is a statistical analysis section. So you want to describe all the statistical analyses that you perform, your descriptive statistics, um, which is common across all studies, your bivariate analysis, and your multivariable analyses. So let's look at the table one of this paper. And so table one is a common, um, like I said, a common thing that you're gonna see in all studies. And you can do this using R packages, um, the, R, the GT summary R package. You can use D table and Stata if you use Stata. And so what the goal of table one is, we wanna see um, the distribution of all the variables in the, um, that you're analyzing. So. For this, they have we'll we'll look at the first column first, the characteristics. Um, you have your your sex, race, ethnicity, age, marital status, education, household income, and then survey cycle. So, and then they have it by inflation stress. So not at all stressful, a little stressful, moderately stressful, and very stressful. Um one thing I would if I were to do this, I would include another column for the overall population. So that will that's what we call your univariate analysis. And what this is showing is the bivariate analysis because it's by um it's all of the sociodemographic characteristics by inflation stress. But it would be nice to see all of the sociodemographic characteristics aggregated over the whole population. For example, like what proportion of the population are are male or female? Um, so this table can't really tell you that, but it can tell you that within each of the inflation stress levels. And then also with this table, um, say I were to do a study, I can I see how they categorize some things. Um, so they have categories for age, marital status, education. So this this already gives you an idea of how some ideas of how you can categorize your measures as well. So next, their table two. So we're looking at their um, their results from their survey weighted ordinal logistical regression. So they did two models. The first model, um, you could see they they don't include education and income, but then they include those two variables. And I would suspect is their final model, model two. And I want to point you to the ends in the parentheses. So this is what I was talking about where their target population is over 300,000 people, but that's not how many um, rows they have in their data set. So this is where the survey weights come into play and then they can help inflate your, um, the survey population to the target population. 
And so, you know, let's recall their research question. So their research question for this study was to look at sociodemographic factors associated with um, inflation stress. So here, what would be statistically significant is a 95% confidence interval that doesn't include one. So they can just read this off like a list. So that you can look at model two and then identify which which coefficients do not include one in the 95% confidence interval. So you can see female, it doesn't include one. Um, this is something you would report. And so what this is saying is that um, females have higher are females have higher odds of being um of having stress related to inflation than males. And so you would just do the same kind of um, comparison across all the sociodemographic characteristics. Um, you're provided with the reference level to show you who's being compared to who. Um, so for example, what's interesting, you can see like the 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 coefficient for black. So in the first model, it is it is significant because it does include one in the in the ninety five percent confidence interval. But then when you adjust for when you include education and income in the model, it's no longer statistically significant. However, um, Hispanic and other race ethnicity are statistically significant. So, you know, th they can write about that in their results. Then you move on to marital status, age group, education, and so forth. And this is how you can, this is how you can write your results section. Um, I would have the each of these bullets as uh, section section headers, so the characteristics of the study symbol. So this would be the sociodemographic characteristics of the overall population, which I mentioned, which wasn't shown. And then now the next section is the characteristics of the study symbol by inflation stress. So this is a bivariate analysis where you can look to see like are um, females more likely to be in this group than another group and so forth. And you kind of just describe that for the reader. And then your, your third section is getting at the original research question, the sociodemographic factors associated with inflation stress. And so this is where you would talk of, you would go down, go down the list of coefficients, see what's significant and describe that. And then after your results section, you have your discussion section. So this is kind of a standard structure. So your first paragraph, you want to summarize your key findings. So like um, you have your research question. So now you have the answer to it. And like, what did you find? But in your discussion section, you don't want to include any numbers. That's what the results section was for. So like the, the odds ratios, 95% confidence intervals, that's what the results section is for. Um, we should not see that in the discussion section. So now you're just using words, you're telling a story about what you found. The second paragraph, now you wanna compare what you found to what's what's in the literature. So are there, are there other studies that studied inflation stress, maybe in a different country, maybe different factors, like um, if it was in a different country, are they also seeing, um, higher stress among females and so forth. So this is kind of what you want to do in this section. In the third paragraph, you want to look into mechanisms um, of why you're seeing what you're seeing. So why are, are females more, um, why do females have higher stress related to inflation than males? So this is where you kind of um, dig into the literature. What are others saying? What are, what, what are the possible mechanisms? And you do this for each of the things the marital status findings that you found, the age groups and so forth. Um, then you wanna talk about um, your limitations of the study. So limitations of it being cross-sectional, you weren't able to um, look at it a, long, a longitudinal analysis. So you couldn't establish, you also couldn't establish like causality. You know, remember that a lot of these are just factors associated with inflation stress, not factors that cause inflation stress. Um, so that's a limitation. Um, there are certain limitations in taking surveys like recall bias, measurement error. Um, then you wanna talk about the strengths of your study, you know, strength of using some of these 
publicly available data sets is that they're nationally representative, um, they're generalizable. Um, if you if you um, use data that's not generalizable, you will definitely need to state that in your limitation section. But it doesn't mean that it won't get published. So don't don't let that disregard you. Also, you want to talk about some potential avenues of future areas of um, research. And sometimes if you're reading papers, these are some ways you can find novel research questions as well is looking in the discussion section, seeing what others propose as future avenues of um, research. And then the last paragraph will be like your conclusion section um, where you just kind of one paragraph, some um, bring it all together. Um, some studies you may see another section for like implications for public public health and policy where you can talk about that. So now I'm going to go to the second study that uses the household pulse survey data and is also looking at inflation. So their study objective, they say the present study has two aims. First, we examine the relationship between inflation hardships and mental health. Um, specified as no inflation hardship, one inflation hardship, two inflation hardships, and so forth. And then second, we test whether gender modifies the association between inflation hardship and distress. So what this is telling me is that they're asking, is inflation hardship associated with mental health? So this was that second bullet I was talking about where it's one variable X, inflation hardship in relation to mental health, and then we have covariates. So, you know, we're no longer thinking about all the sociodemographic factors in relation to mental health. We're just focused on inflation, hardship, and mental health. And the second part of this question is, does this association vary by gender? So what this is telling you is that they want to test for an interaction. So an interaction between inflation, hardship, and gender in relation to mental health. And then again, so their first section is what I call the study design and um, setting. So where they described that, they also described how they arrived at their analytic sample. Um, so you can see, yeah, you can see probably like five or six lines down, they say they use the list wise deletion method to handle missing data. So what this means is anybody that had missing data on any variables, they dropped, they dropped from their um their data set and then they analyze only those who have measures on all um all of the measures that they're considering. And then next they have a section where they describe their dependent variable, which is mental health. Um, Right here, they have distress was measured using the four item patient health questionnaire for anxiety and depression. So this is a validated measure. And we know that they use four questions to create this measure. So this is why it's important to look at the literature of, of a published study that use the data set that you're going to um, use. Um, because if you were just looking at the survey or the questionnaire, you may not have known that those four questions make up a validated measure. And so now you can see it in uh, published literature that these four questions make up that measure. And then um, what you also want to describe is how, like what were the response options that survey participants had? And so you can see that they were not at all several days, more than half days and nearly every day. So, okay, we, now we know the response options. How are they scored? So you want to tell the reader that, oh, you sum you sum the responses to create, um, well, they sum to create an index of distress symptoms. Um, so now the range is from zero to 16. And how they got that zero to 16 is because they probably did not at all as, um, as um, like they probably made it zero, one, two, three, four, and then across four items, you will get 16. And then what you see in parentheses, the alpha, so this is your reliability. If you have any scales, you should present the Cronbach's alpha value. So values, um, I wanna say like, I mean, the higher, the better, of course, but like, I think it's 
0.70 and higher, then you know you have something good there. And then they also provide you some citations. So these are some things that you can look at. Um, so it tells you the measure is well validated and captures symptoms of anxiety and depression. Next, they're going to describe their independent variables. So inflation, hardship, and gender, which is the key focus of this paper. So they show you which question they um, use to define inflation hardship. So this is different from um, inflation stress from the first paper. So now they're looking at the question that says, what changes, if any, have you made to cope with the increases in prices? Select all that apply. And then they tell you exactly how they created this inflation hardship measure. Um, so they have 18 items. They sum the 18 items and then recoded them into six categories. So if you were to do a study, you have the formula right here if you wanted to use inflation hardship um, in your analyses. And then for um, gender identity, that'll be like the last small paragraph at the end. Um, this is very important how because there's a lot of um, discussion around how to define sex in studies or how to define gender. So it's important to put that. Um, it may... I would suggest putting the exact question that survey participants were asked so that it's very transparent um, of, which, of what you're measuring. And then you can see that they dropped some, some people due to a small sample size. So the transgender category had 509 and um, those who were identified as other they dropped them from the analysis too. So you want to be as transparent as possible, again, so that someone could pick up your paper and redo your analysis. Also in the independent variables, do you want to talk about the covariates? So a lot of these covariates um, are probably the same sociodemographic factors that they used in the first study, but now they're framed as covariates and they're not the main focus. So here we have education, income, employment status, race, number of children in the household, age, um, a quadratic term for age. So people tend to use quadratic terms or you could raise um, raise age to the third power to allow for non-linearity non between the exposure and the outcome. Next, you have marital status, region, and survey week. And then they describe their statistical analysis. So as I mentioned, weighted descriptive statistics, something you can do in the uh, survey R package and um, survey commands and Stata. And then they employ an ordinary um, least squares regression. This answers the first question, is inflation hardship associated with mental health? Then they test for interaction between inflation hardship and gender, which answers your second question. Does this association vary by gender? So again, um, as expected, your table one. <clears throat> table one, we have our demographic characteristics. So they're looking at by gender because that is the focus of this paper is does the association um, vary by gender? So they did their bivariate by gender. Um, as I said before, I would have included an overall column just to give um, the distribution of the overall study population. And you can see the ordering matters too. So they put the same order that they wrote the um, sections in. So we start with the outcome measure, which is distress. You're telling the reader your mean and your standard deviation. Next, you're going to tell them inflation hardship because that is a that is a focus of this paper. And then next you have your covariates, which are not the focus. So you can just put them after that. So now they have their um, regression models. So the first model, they have inflation hardship and gender. There's no interaction, just those, just those two. And then um, they have covariates, but the covariates are not the focus of this. So that's why I'm not showing you those coefficients. And so in the second model, it's the same model as model one, but now they include the interaction between inflation, hardship, and gender. And so interactions can be hard to interpret. 
So for example, we see that the uh, Indep the independent association of five or more inflation hardships has a positive beta, so 5.5 on um, 47. But if you look at the last row, the interaction with female of five or more inflation hardships and female is negative. So now we have coefficients going in opposite directions. One is positive, one is negative. But one way to to help interpret this is to plot the predicted um the pre plot the predicted outcome and that's what they did here in figure 2 and so now you see the predicted distress score on the y axis and the x axis you have the inflation hardships and then we have two different lines um between um, male and female so as you can see it starts off um pretty close but then when it gets to 4 um it kind of like switches. And then at five, you see that males have a higher than higher score than females. And so that that is what's coming from that model and how it's easier that you can visualize and see what's happening. And so you can plot these, you can get these values using the margins command and then doing margins plot and stata. Um, in R, you can use the marginal effects pack, package after model. Um, and including a visualization will help, like, you know, any reader that doesn't have a strong statistical background to understand what this beta and these interactions even mean. And so, again, the outline in the results section, talk, talk about um, characteristics of the study sample. Then you would talk about your bivariate results, the study sample by gender identity. Um, and then you could talk about inflation, hardship, gender, identity, and mental health, which was the main objective, main research questions of this paper. Um, and again, here's the outline and discussion section. I won't go through this again as we um, as we went through it before. But you have any, if you have any questions, we could talk about it afterwards. <laughs> So now um, we could talk about types of types of research questions. So as I said before, you can have exploratory or descriptive um, research question that was study one, which was you know what socio demographic characteristics are associated with inflation stress among U.S. adults, or you can have like a relational associational study, which was study two, um, that looked at inflation hardship and mental health, and does that vary by gender? <clears throat> um, another possible thing you could do is, um, like, this is if you had, um, like, an outcome over time. So say we had the household post survey 2024, 2023, 2022, so forth, going all the way back, like, let's just say 10 years, and we can model the proportion of those who um, had like inflation stress or something like that. Like you could create a proportion and see how that proportion um, model that proportion over time. And what you could look at is like, say there's like some policy impact or impact of COVID-19. So like in 2020, we could look at the trend before COVID and then the trend during the COVID era and see if like, Oh, were people, more stressed about inflation before COVID or, you know, now after COVID, like, you know, you can answer a lot of different research questions just by one thing. So like what I'm trying to say, what I'm telling you here is that we started off with one question about inflation stress. And then we looked at two published papers um, and then we saw how, how they developed that into two different research questions. And so that's the importance of going through the survey, going through the code book, data dictionary to find a question that interests you. And not only for these reasons, but because when you do the literature review, it'll keep you um, motivated. Like if I'm really interested in something, I'm going to keep reading the literature. I'm going to like, you know, you're going to be more alert. But if you're studying something that's boring to you, you're less likely to like, you know, see it through, like be persistent with the whole process. And lastly, some statistical methods that you could think about if you're looking at a time series or a segmentation is like interrupted time series, um, joint point regression.
difference in differences and so many more other approaches. We discussed this. Um, and then, yeah, so many research questions that can be answered. So like potential follow-up studies, like you could look at is gender associated with inflation stress? And does that association vary by race, ethnicity? Um, recall that study two focused on inflation hardship, which was different, a different question than inflation stress. So that's one, that's one study right there. You can interchange, um, gender and race, like, you know, look at race, is race is associated with inflation stress? Does that association vary by gender? Uh, you know, there's so many things you could do. Um, and then you can identify covariates from like the gender and race literature. Um, you could also exchange those variables for something else, like looking at marital status, age group, education, income. So that right there is like four or five different um, research questions or four or five different papers, all in different kind of like different areas that you can study just, just based off of one question. And so then you also want to, you know, when you write your introduction and justify your research questions, like, you know, what theoretical frameworks can help contextualize your research question. Um, I do a lot of work in like social epidemiology. So, you know, you might look at like the intersectionality um, theory or this textbook by Nancy Krieger. She's, you know, a well-known social epidemiologist. So this textbook has like, you know, theory and context that you can apply to your study. But, you know, there are theories in all, all different fields, psychology, you know, occupational health, um, health policy. So a lot of different frameworks that you can help um, frame your research question and frame your study. And so just to recap, you know, first you want to find a publicly available data set. You want to understand the details of your of the of the data source, like what was the purpose, um, how frequently was it um, issued. So the household poll survey was on and off for two weeks. That's how they um, recruit members. And you want to look at the code book. Then you want to read the survey as if you were taking it to identify a research question that interests you. Um, also use Google Scholar, you know, make Google Scholar your best friend to see how others have analyzed that survey. Um, what questions are they using to um, for different measures? Like, you know, if you're interested in mental health, um, a lot of these, a lot of these um, data sources tend to have measures that comprise like the PHQ-9, PHQ-4. And what the number means is just how many questions make up that measure. Um, and so you will find maybe like the PHQ-2, which is a two item of the PH, um, PHQ-9. And so why you would see that is because, you know, two questions versus nine questions. So like if you have a survey that has all these different measures, we're trying to reduce um, survey fatigue. So if we can um, insert like a two item measure for mental health instead of nine questions, that's better. So that's, you know, some of those things you have to kind of understand the nuances. And then, you know, see what questions remain uh, unanswered. Like a lot of interaction terms are very interesting to study, not only in the cross-sectional setting, but also in a longitudinal se setting as well. Um, and, you know, it's, with the interaction terms, you can plot, you can plot the predictions from the model to see what's going on. So like, even if you had like a three-way interaction or something like that. You can, although it may be hard to interpret just looking at the coefficients, we can just plot it by group and just see what what's what what the trends are. Um, yeah, so that concludes my presentation. Um, I want to thank you for your time and I wanted to save the rest of the time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Bather. Are there any questions? I see a hand, but that might be applause from Lexi Z Zinzelmeyer. Yeah, that was just an applause. <laughs> Thank you.
please feel free to ask questions and I'm going to go on mute because of the Hey, Jamar, this is Kaylee from uh, the Dean's office at GPH. I was just, can you talk a little bit just in general about when you're in the process of writing a thesis, um, just a little bit maybe about time management. And I know you talked a lot about different topics and data sets available and, you know, just talking a little bit about picking a topic you're excited about and trying to make sure that you're staying on topic and on time with what you're trying to do and how picking your topic can be very important to doing that? Um, yeah, so, all right, so you asked the question about time management. Yeah, so time management is very important, um, especially, you know, you all have like full course loads and things like that. So what I recommend is like, I tend to use checklists. And so, you know, I'll make a checklist of the things I wanna do for the for the day. And it might just be like three things, like cleaning the data, setting up the variables, um, and then move, you know, set something for the next day, like write my study design section, things like that. So, you know, what I would recommend is just try to break things down into like small little pieces and, you know, it'll all add up at the end. Um, you know, you all will be taking classes, so you don't want to wait till the last minute for deadlines, like, although like something may be due in December for your thesis course, it's best to kind of just start working on it now because you don't know what's in the literature. You know, you you may start something, your question's already answered, but like the quicker that you can identify it hasn't been answered, then you could start working and developing the thesis. Um, and then like the more that you are clear about the measures and stuff like that, um, the easier it is for your thesis advisor to like understand what's going on without even seeing the data set or being even familiar with the data set that you're working on. Um, and you're more likely to get better feedback the more clear more clear you are. I'll add one thing. Um, when you get assigned your thesis advisor, I highly encourage you to reach out to them early and sit down and discuss your proposal with them and then meet with them early in the spring semester um, and set up regular times to work with them so that you do not um, come to them at the, right before your thesis is due and uh, have not met with them. I highly encourage you. We also have a question that says, could you talk about how to choose the, paper, the proper topic? Like, is it too general? Is it too specific? What is the principle? Uh -huh. That's a good question, but I think your question itself is too general. Um, but I would say that the more narrow you can get, the better. Um, the more narrow you can get, the I would say the higher probability that it's novel, that nobody hasn't looked at that specific um, crevice of research. Um, general, I just think general comes up when you know, for reviewers re reviewing your thesis and they're like, you're trying to do too much or like your data doesn't answer this question. Um, so I would tend, I mean, this is very case dependent, but I would try to strive for being more specific. I would also add too that when you're considering questions, you know, when you're first exploring your topic, you might start with a more general question about, I want to do research into X area and I wanna look at a few of these different things just to see what the data is telling you or where the direction is going. But by the time you get to the point where you're picking a thesis question and you're writing your thesis, you do need to be more on the specific side because if your thesis is too broad, you're not gonna end up answering a question. You're just gonna end up answering, you know, throwing out a bunch of general thoughts about the data you analyzed, which is not a thesis. Part of what a thesis is, is a high level of specificity. So you might start a little bit more general, but you're gonna have to drill down and be pretty specific to make sure that you have a quality thesis question and that you're answering that question thoroughly in your final thesis. Dr. Bather, um, 
someone is curious about how you usually find the journals you are interested in publishing your, publishing your papers in? Uh, I have different methods, but, you know, after I finish writing the paper, you may have like, you can look in your references and you may have cited a journal a couple of times. So that's a good indicator um, that that journal will likely be interested in your work because you're citing papers that are similar to what you did. So the journal um, will probably consider that. Um, sometimes they're like call for papers or special issues that may be on a topic that um, we're interested in. And so then I'll choose that journal. Um, you could try for the special issue. Um, special issues tend to have deadlines. And so that also helps you with time management as well. Um, another thing I wanna talk about time management. Um, there are a lot of annual conferences that um, researchers attend every year. So a lot of us are going to APHA. Um, APHA is around the same time every year. Abstract deadlines are around the same time every year. So you can like plan ahead, like, oh, I'm working on my thesis. I want to at least have something to write for abstract to submit to APHA at the top of 2025. Um, if you're an epidemiologist, there's SER, Society of Epidemiologic Research um, Statisticians. You have JSM, you have ENR. So, you know, if you kind of put in these self-imposed deadlines, that can help you as well to stay on track. Um, a lot of these conferences have student travel awards where they will pay for your travel and housing to go present your work. Um, so that's an opportunity to, you know, travel to some someplace you've never been, present your work, see what others are working on. Um, you all are second year students. So it'll be an opportunity to go to like the career fairs at these conferences, network with potential um, employers that are hiring. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Jane is also an option where you can put in the title and your abstract and it'll find, um, give you some suggestions, but also your advisor is a good um, source of knowledge. They have a long history of publishing. They may know what journals, like what certain topics or how you did certain things. Um, yeah. Dr. Basser, could you talk a little bit about um, finding the right variables? I've had students come to me as their thesis advisor with this really great research question that they want to answer. And then they come to me with a data set that they want to use and the data set doesn't match the question. So they'll like want to look at, somebody wanted to look at, I don't know, something very, very specific, some very, very specific cardiovascular outcome, which was not available in like NHANES, but they wanted to use NHANES. So can you talk a little bit about matching your research question to the data set? Yeah, and that's why I wanted, you know, I emphasize that in today's talk is to find the data source and look through the code book first, because then you already know that data is there for you. So like, you know, the example you've given me, you know, the student would have already seen that the cardiovascular outcome is measured in the code book and what, what variable and how it's measured continuous and so forth. But if you just try to go at it the reverse way, you're likely to just end up in a circular motion of, oh, I found something I want to be um, study, but I don't have the data to analyze it. And then you may have to go through loopholes, um, especially for some of these, for some of those types of outcomes that are found in, are found in the electronic health record or, you know, these type of things you have to submit IRB you have to get um, approval to even analyze these things. So you have to think about that um, because you have to factor in that time in your thesis and the deadline. So um, looking at these publicly available data sources is kind of like your, you know, a best bet to like account for any mishaps that may happen throughout the year. The other thing I'll say about secondary data sources is that if you learn how to use these data sets, you will always have data. You will never have to, you will never be without data to analyze and to write papers about because you'll have learned how to manipulate these somewhat complex uh, data sets. Um, and so you won't have to rely on somebody else uh, and you won't be idle while you're waiting for, for your study to finish collecting data or something like that.
Are there any other questions? I've dropped the link to Jane, um, biosemantics.org in the chat. You can basically search keywords and that will show you what journals uh, some, of the uh, some of the topics are being published in. Um, the next thing, if there are no other questions, I, uh, we just wanna go over uh, the lightning talks that are coming up. Do you have those slides or would you like me to show those, Dr. Bather? I think um, Sydney. I have the... I have them. I just wanted to make sure you weren't going to. Oh, no, so no. give me a minute as I bring them up, and hopefully I can figure out how to share my screen. Uh oh, that's not the right thing. Okay, so let me share my screen. Wonderful. So there are going to be a series of faculty lightning talks, um, and these are for uh, master thesis opportunities throughout the month of September. Uh, these will um, are designed to inform second year master students from uh, biostatistics, epidemiology, and social and behavioral sciences about potential thesis topics that align with faculty interests and expertise. The sessions are going to be virtual, and there'll be four speakers each um, talking about their research for about 10 minutes, and then ending with a slide about potential thesis topics, data sets, or research questions. And then they'll, ha they'll have Q&A after um, each talk. Uh, faculty will be coming from GPH, Wagner, um, the School of Social Work, Steinhor Steinhardt, um, Pop Health over at the School of Medicine, and the College of Nursing. And we really want to invite you to explore the different offerings and register for as many of the sessions as you would like. Um, so the first one is September 4th, and that will be Dr. Guastafaro, Dr. Gershon, Dr. Cook, and Dr. Potensky, all from the School of uh, Global Public Health. Um, and they're coming from SBS, EPI, and Biosat. Um, on September 5th, we'll have um, Dr. Armstrong Huff from Public Health, Dr. Kleinenberg from Wagner, Dr. Satterstrom from Wagner, and Dr. Travers from Nursing. On September 11th, we will have uh, Dr. Dahlin from Global Health, uh, Dr. Mai, Dr. Merginoff, and Dr. Hatna from Global Health. On September 17th, we will have um, Dr. Homanoff from Wagner, Dr. Konopka, from Steinhardt, Dr. Kirker from Langone, and Dr. Armeni from Wagner. Um, so these are really going to be interesting talks. Um, then September 18th, we have Dr. Gilligan from Steinhardt, Dr. Brody from the College of Nursing, Dr. Paulette from Wagner, and Dr. Guan from Wagner. September 19th, we have Dr. Zhu, uh, Shu um, from Global Public Health and Dr. Pawa and Han from Social Work. And then finally on September 25th, we have Dr. Squires, uh, Sada, Sada Rangani and Morali from uh, Nursing and Dr. Maglalong from uh, Social Work. So we hope that you will take advantage of these talks. Um, it's an opportunity to um, find out about what people are doing. Even if you already have your thesis topic, it's a great opportunity to learn about more about research. And then we have a master's thesis research sheet for you. You can get it through this QR code. Um, this will be uh, useful for you as you uh, work to craft your master's thesis. And it contains a lot of resources that you might find useful. So we will also make sure this goes out to you, um, but uh, take a moment to um, get, the, get the QR code and I'll see if I can copy it and put it in the chat. Oh, somebody already put it in the chat. Thank you, Dr. Blaney. Okay, are there any questions? Well, 
I want to thank you for coming on a, Thursday, uh, on a Friday in August before classes even start. Um, I uh, really want to thank Dr. Bather for his presentation. That was very useful. Um, and it was a, a really nice walkthrough of what a thesis um, might look like. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank um, Dr. Blaney uh, for helping to, um, to uh, moderate this. Good luck with All right. your thesis, Have a everyone. Yes. All right. Thank you for having me. Have a great weekend. Thank you.